Today's video is with David Burchard from Micro Acres in Airdrie, Alberta. I have visited David and his wife Kirsten uh, a few times now and got to know them quite a bit over the years. They're my number one YouTube video. Also have done two really good features here at FromTheField.tv. Today I'll be sharing this video with YouTube as well. This is the kind of content that is exclusive to FromTheField.tv, all this long form, hyper detailed content. This is what I do at FromTheField.tv. We've also got a number of other content creators uh, as well producing content like this. But I figured let's put this out in the public and share it with people because I know it's gonna help a lot of people out there uh, and give you some some ideas on how you might change your business model to adapt to the current situations that we're in. And uh, this whole shift in the economy has affected a lot of people, for better or worse. And it's blindsided a lot of people. We, David and I refer to that uh, in this interview as the black swan. Some of you might be familiar with the work of Nassim Taleb. Uh, his seminal book, Anti-Fragile, was, was sort of a philosophy that I completely adopted five or six years ago and changed everything in my business to be anti-fragile. Uh, David has done a similar thing and they had a little bit of a blip when the uh, proverbial shit hit the fan but they adapted quickly and have really come out on top and there's so much value in this interview guys. I hope you enjoy it and if, again if you want to see more stuff like this head over to fromthefield.tv and check it out. David thanks for joining me here. Absolutely, thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Yeah, I wanted to, um, I really wanted to, to have you on and talk about, you know, kind of how, wh what's been going on with your business lately. You know, you guys are um, a microgreen grower that I tell a lot of people about, you know, your, uh, your video is now my most popular video on my YouTube channel. I love what you guys are doing. We've, we've uh, hung out a bit on your farm. I know a lot about your operation. And uh, I was over there, what was that, in February? And um, this was before the, the shit hit the fan. And um, there were the, all of these changes um, that happened to everybody's business hadn't happened to you at that point. And so what I wanted to, to, to talk to you about in this episode is, you know, how has this, these changes been for you? And uh, what are some of the things you guys have done? For sure. You no, know, the biggest thing was obviously mid-March, as, as everyone knows, essentially Canada and the U.S. and most of the world, essentially the culinary scene shut down. So restaurants, anybody on the food service side. And uh, it was actually quite a unique day because it was actually our harvest day. So we had probably two, almost 300 pounds, essentially in process, in uh, packages. And it started with one restaurant, two restaurants. And in the course of the 24 hours, we had all 100 restaurants either contacts in some format to let us know that they're basically closing the doors. So we had, uh, yeah, it was a unique day for sure. And uh, we had to kind of figure out what we were gonna do, but the biggest challenge was we had product. It was a harvested, it was packaged into our wholesale formats. And within 24 hours, we were able to pivot pretty quick. And within 48 hours, we had all 250 pounds, let's say, repackaged into our retail formats and out the door to clients, direct to consumer model. We had a huge roster of clients we've been able to build over the course of two years uh, that we were able to tap into through multiple different arteries and revenue, um, you know, Facebook, Instagram. We asked for help from people we knew just to, hey, can you share this? We need to get product out the door. And it was really amazing. We had almost 400 orders come through in less than two days. And, wow. after and we actually made more money because of the margin base. And it was amazing, really amazing that it really went from a boat we were running with 90% culinary side, 10% yes. retail, uh, and that was basically a full on switch. We still had a couple establishments do right away, start to do you know the delivery, the curbside delivery. You've kind of heard about scene. Uh, we've got a few more restaurants back on since, but we're still only running maybe 80% retail sector, 20% culinary side even now, uh, and we're running probably back up to about 80% of our initial revenue. We went down to from our revenue back then we were almost at 20 grand. Uh, a month of revenue went down to probably a thousand less than 24 hours and we back up about 80 percent of that to date so it was a huge pivot huge switch we had to really rely on a lot of other factors but we had to do it quickly and that's what we realized initially this had to be done right away and that was i think part of our success but it was a lot of work for sure but we've also established a whole new revenue stream we have consistent clients now that probably 
another 50, 60 clients a week order from us that probably will be with us um, as much as they can, you know, month after month, year after year. And we've established that through not only the direct consumer model, but also a lot of programs. More recently, we started a salad uh, program. So this stemmed from a great idea of some farms in the US that we kind of uh, looked into and the model looked great. And we just started offering that. So we looked at microgreens as a collective whole and you can't always make just a salad of microgreens no matter how much you want to. You know, yeah, it's exactly. And so forth. Uh, so we wanted to add some more pea shoes, so to create a blend, but we also wanted to bring on other local, uh, uh, local businesses. So we partnered up initially with a uh, salad, um, excuse me, um, salad dressing company, a very local one here in our community. They did salad dressing. They were selling farmers markets. We said, hey, can you cultivate a proprietary salad dressing that we could add into the salad program? And then we reached out to local greenhouses to add on produce weekly. So cherry tomatoes, cukes, uh, as things come into season here in the summertime, a lot of peppers, head lettuce, a lot of these. But again, two-pronged approach, not only to bring other local businesses into our model and also help, help them as well a little bit, but we can actually create a salad for people. What does everyone want? They want a salad. It's a very convenient, approachable product that most people eat somewhat on a weekly, if not a daily basis. So that was a way we were able to cultivate a ton of revenue very quickly by offering an eight-week program and then essentially getting all that initial capital up front, which then allows us to stay in business until everything passes here. Wow. Um... So there's, there's a lot there. Thank you for that. that that's a really yeah. good summary of kind of where you're at. That, that, that gives me a lot to uh, kind of think about and follow up with. I mean, one, one thing I'm, I'm really curious about is, okay, so you talked about those 50 or so new customers. Now, are those customers of this salad program where they're, they're now coming in and getting this this pat this it's like a it's like a home delivery how, how, what are the logistics yeah. of that whole thing for sure so basically it's an eight week program that we are delivering again direct to their house so and the biggest thing we offer we never do and this is part of our business model but we have uh, no delivery fees ever so we have to deliver on a geographical base for sure but again right now you got to kind of do what you have to do to you know survive to keep big. yeah right we definitely increased our radius but we have probably, I think, 40 people in the current program. We have almost 60 signed up for the summer program. And we're going to run this on uh, a two-month base because it's taking off. But we've gained certainly a lot of customers through that and referral base. Again, it's a lot more convenient when you talk about selling a salad versus selling a microgreen to a lot of people just through to on the education side. A lot of people still don't know what microgreen is. So instead of having to adopt the educational aspect into the selling perspective, we sell it as a salad as a salad share, and then we basically incorporate what's gonna be included in that program. People know what tomatoes are, they know what salad dressing. So it really makes it a lot more approachable in that accord. But yeah, definitely that 50 incorporates the salad program as well. We have some repeat customers from our microgreen uh, subscription program. But in addition, it's just been, you know, someone's telling their sister, they're ordering. It's that trickle down effect that we're seeing that's really taken off. So on our subscription base, we have about 50 to 70 weekly we deliver to. And then we have this additional 60 or so we deliver to on the salad share program on a different day on a weekly base. So about 120 people we deliver to direct to their house. Again, trying to adopt the policy, this curbside delivery, having that distance, anywhere we can kind of make people feel more comfortable and safe in this current situation. We want to adopt that into our delivery policy as well. Wearing gloves, taking any precautions we can. Again, the goal is to make people feel, the end user, they got to feel comfortable yeah. in this procedure to be effective in this manner. Right. Wow. So uh, I'm curious, um, what was the, what was the previous microgreen subscription program? Like what did that look like before this change? Cause now you, you mentioned there's two things, right? There's the yeah. salad subscription and then there's the microgreen subscription. What did those two packages look like? Like tell me like what's in those, those boxes or bags and what's the kind of retail value of them? The subscription came basically out of just initially when we first started in retail, when we first began the company two years ago, we started, we always tracked who was receiving what, just to kind of see just the demographic base where people were ordering from. We also noticed the trend that people were ordering in a four week period, five week period, they're ordering three, four times. So they were basically already ordering on a weekly base. So we started cultivating a monthly subscription where they could pre-order, or on a pre-order per se, they could sign up for a four week program. So every week on the same day, they would get X amount of products. So the most 
common one is three units. So that's always a mix and match. So one pea shoot, one sunflower, one radish, whatever it might be every week for a four week period for X amount of money. And they would prepay that at the beginning of the month. And we developed this because we saw a lot of programs from a lot of the farmers who would do three months at a time, even four months at a time. It's really hard to gauge your own personal habits and you know your schedule three to four months out. So I found that right. typically in the approachability perspective. So one month is an easier pill as well. You know, it's like, oh yeah, I know what I'm gonna do the next four weeks. But within that, we also allow flexibility. So every um, 48 hours prior to our delivery, we would always confirm with everyone. We've had clients with us for two years on this and they still forget we're coming on the Saturday morning for delivery. It just kind of happens, right? So <laughs> right. we need to take that human factor into account, but also, so if they go away, or it's also weather dependent. If you come in the winter, we got to let them know we're going to come to your door between this time and this time. If you're not home, we're going to take the product back. You have to pick it from the farm. If it's yeah, because it's going to freeze. Yeah. Exactly. Summertime, we've got to put a cooler out with an ice pack. It's 30 degrees out. All those factors, right? So it allows us to always to maintain that communication so we don't waste your time for delivery if they're not there or whatever happens. But in right. addition, it allows for the flexibility for ordering. If they want, if we maybe introduce a new product that week, say, hey, can I try that new radish? Can I try that new mix? Whatever it might be. So they can change up the order. The key with the subscription was flexibility. So yep. they, could, they could skip a week if they didn't want that week because they're away at holidays or maybe they didn't consume as much that week for whatever part reason, they could skip that week and make that four-week program into a five-week program. So we right. always wanted that flexibility for that end user perspective, which again, allowed us to have a lot more sales. Right, the sales right. Sales basically came as a way to generate a lot more um, a lot more revenue there. So yeah, there's a website there. So and we actually just recently added um, an order now button on the top. So again, we don't ever, we don't have a shopping cart or anything on the website, but it's just a way to bring product. Um, you know, some people just like using the web, a website as a platform. So if you, we usually did most everything through Facebook, Instagram. This way we can kind of um, qualify a lot of people kind of where they're from. Because every now and then right. we have a random order coming in, you know, from Spain or from Florida. We don't ship there okay. yet. Um, so <laughs> it kind of allows us to mitigate a lot of uh, those orders that do come about. Uh, but yeah, we really try to create a consolidated website that has a showcase. All of our products has a flavor or a tasting note behind it. And we want this to be, again, very convenient, very approachable for both of our clients, both on a retail perspective and on the culinary side. We want to showcase the best greens, the best flavor profiles, and everything's available to a chef is also available to our retail side. We've always okay. done that and at the same, relatively the same price point. So yeah. it can be convenient, it can be approachable, it can be utilized as much as the rest would use it on a home front. So what's it worth to you to deliver? Like what's your, you gotta have a minimum order. You're not gonna deliver to somebody sure. for five no. bucks, right? You sure would. No minimums, no delivery fees. Yeah. Really? So we wow. do that, yeah. never had a minimum. Uh, we do, everything geographically. So if we take on an order, they just fall within a delivery day. And that's, okay. so there's rapidity within flexibility. So that's understanding the culinary side, that's understanding convenience. So our average delivery day is between, when we're doing restaurants, between 40 and 70 restaurants in one day, that'll take us anywhere from three to five hours to do max. Probably doing maybe 150 square kilometer, 150 kilometer round trip. Wow, that's, that's a pretty fast delivery for that it many. Sure is. Yeah, stops like you guys must be cranking <laughs> well, we'll have restaurants that you, you look at the urban setting of uh where we are and honestly we can get well sometimes five restaurants in two square blocks so we can just literally hit one after another again most urban settings have a lot of restaurants you know back to back so that's one of the ways that we cultivate a lot of our um opportunity we have one restaurant we'll follow up with one you know adjacent to them so we can do you know within a 10 minute span i can do six deliveries very quickly so that's, that's insane. Way. Yeah. So yeah, our average, I guess our biggest day was like something like a Tuesday. We'll do 65 restaurants on that day. And uh, yeah, so there you go. So we'll hit basically from Airdrie where we are there. We'll do yep. all of Calgary uh, as far west as the foothills and the mountains and circle back. Crap. And we'll be gone by 9 a.m. and be home by back to the farm by 1.30 pretty easily. And so you, you're, uh, just so I understand this, uh, you might've said this, but I apologize if I missed it. You're stacking in the entire, so when you're talking, you're going out for your delivery run, you're delivering to restaurants and homes, all, you're doing it all in one shot. 
Nope, we have three delivery days. And we okay, have, okay. So we have two main wholesale delivery days that are okay. cultivated for two different days, and we have one retail day. So we separate those in that accordance, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Wow. Because, yeah, I, I imagine the, um, yeah, just simply the volume of product when you're going down to Calgary to deliver to the restaurants is going to be uh, significantly different in how it's loaded into your vehicle uh, yeah, right. than it's it would be for. Yeah. We run yeah. 400 units. It's just, you run out of space after a while until you get multiple delivery vans, right? But this works, this is part of our business model being very concise, very streamlined in the operational aspect that we can mitigate this. Our, you know, we're running at full capacity. We were running back in March there. We were running with um, the two full-time employees, myself and um, Kirsten, and then our one part-time employee. We were still under 40 hours a week in labor hours, all inclusively, including delivery time. That's not bad. That's really not bad. I mean, so how many, how, what, what, how many deliveries total in a week is that we're talking about? Like overall? Uh, Listen, so retail might be 60 to 70. Wholesale would be between 70 to 100, depending on the week. Holy crap. So that is, uh, wow, that's a lot of drop-offs. Are moving. you guys using, what's that? It's moving, but again, it's very concise. Very, let's say that's part of the model. That's what we cultivated from the beginning. That's with my background in culinary understanding. We have to think of the end user. Again, so many yeah. farmers just grow for growing sake. We have to look at what is needed in the marketplace. How do we bring across, um, across you know, products that can be utilized across all plating, across all um, retail clients? We so funny as farmers, we so often like, oh, what do I want to grow? What are people growing? Let's do this. And you get so spread out on the farming side, you kind of forget about actually bringing products to the marketplace to have a profitable business. Yeah, unreal. I mean, what? <sighs> I, I just, I'm amazed that you're doing that many stops. Um, well, you know, take me kind of through, like, how does it look like you talked a little bit about your protocols as far as when you drop off product to the homeowner, uh, as far as, you know, communicating to them, you don't want to leave stuff outside if it's too hot or too warm, yeah. but how does that look like? Are you pretty much coming in? Um, knocking on the door. Hey, how you doing? Here's the product. See you later. Like, is it, like, what does yeah, that actually look like? Yeah. We basically knock, ring the doorbell. Like again, now the current situation is pretty much you no know, knock, ring the doorbell and then leave. We then, we just kind of, you know, go back to the vehicle and make sure it's picked up. And then if we don't see it picked up, we just send a quick text or whatever communication format we were dealing with them. Uh, just to let them know. Uh, again, we never really had issues with people kind of forgetting, but again, that's where we do try to mitigate any of the onus. So we do reach out 48 hours before let them know the window we will be there and we try to do the best we can on controllables but prior to that we would ring the doorbell usually talk to people and obviously we always want that relationship and that communication but again we do want to adhere to the current practices and be as careful as we can as everyone is in different states on how they're approaching the situation and we want yeah to sure. right wow. um yeah it, it's a, and are you using any kind of uh software to manage all those delivery drop-offs do you plan no, it out I, just Excel, it is planned out for sure, like geographically, so everything's in a route form. And again, after a while, it becomes very habitual, just driving it, if you drive the same route every week, and then okay. if you take on a client, we'll just slot them into wherever they are geographically onto whatever best delivery day would suit us. Right, so you're basically managing all this between spreadsheets and then you're using Google Maps yeah. or something to pinpoint where they are, looking at your yeah. route, deciding where they fit along that line, and. Pretty much, yeah. And, and that's going for it. That's your cell, and then um, you truck everything off these through the, um, the computer, and then everything is transferred on site of the farm to a whiteboard. So, again, we have a, you know, we're running two, three hundred tubs. I don't want to read size 10 font when I'm at the farm at four in the morning. Yeah, we right. <laughs> whiteboard, we communicate, you know, so it also makes it effective. So, for example, if I was doing this on a Friday and we do a harvest on Saturday, I couldn't make it in the farm the same transfers to our employee can come in and read exactly what the metric is. Great, four kohlrabi, 10 kale, whatever it is, they know the unit size and they pack accordingly. Wow, wow. It's, um, yeah, it's incredible. So I, I, want, I want to talk a little bit about more of this, this whole um, salad subscription that you brought in. So you're sourcing some product from other growers. Um, yeah. how, what, what are those baskets? 
look look like each and and talk about some of the the products that you are sourcing to to bulk it out for sure so the two like we have basically do a family size um salad so you know pea shoots micro pea shoots and sunflowers are predominant base just because they hold the dress better and they're a little more substantial and then we incorporate different daily microgreens or weekly microgreens into it so last week we had popcorn week before the beginning we did carrot and nasturtiums just kind of well ways to round it out and then we have a special product on so every week um I think this week will be amaranth. Last week was, we did a special arugula for that was tatsoi, kind of a unique single one varietal uh, little container to something more unique at the farm. Uh, then we have once a month is a uh, 500 mil dressing. So that'll come from a partnership with the salad dressing company. We don't do that on site. Uh, that's a completely separate company. We buy from them. We incorporate that in on week one and week five of the program. And then weekly they get, a different vegetable. So right now there's not a lot of seasons that are in the cusp here. So basically we're doing cherry tomatoes and cucumbers, uh, vine yep. tomato that kind of style. Uh, peppers, I think we're coming in, we're gonna grab some of those, leaf leads, bibs, that kind of stuff. Um, and then just get yeah, more unique stuff as the season permits from the greenhouse that we do purchase from. So they always get one produce, they get um, every fourth week, they get uh, salad, excuse me, a salad dressing, but they always get the half pound of the salad itself, which changes and rotates weekly in addition to getting that weekly special diet of microgreen. Right. And how does it work for you guys logistically getting other product from growers with the space you have? Cause I've, I've been to your warehouse a few times yep. and uh, you're get going to get all these, this other product. Are, are, are they delivering it to you? Are you they picking it, it up? Yeah. Nope, okay. They so they, yeah. Yeah, and then you basically basically do that on the day of delivery. So you, you're you're uh, not sitting and holding that product for a period of time. No, it's usually the the night before. So especially stuff like tomatoes, all that we, it, it can't be sitting in seventy five degree temps. So we'll get it the night before, keep it cool, and then I'll get packaged the day of kind of thing. So yeah, it's okay. less than twenty four hours from anything that arrives on site. Now salad dressing also exclusively usually that comes in maybe a couple of days prior. But like the salad dressing is so fresh, it's literally made the week of from the company. So it can go out. So it's quite. So, yeah, well, I'm you, sure the salad dressing is fine, but what about other yeah. greens you get? You know, uh, from another grower, you mentioned that you you got some other greens. Uh, well, we get we work with one greenhouse, and they drop off the night prior. So they'll drop off on like we do our deliveries on Monday morning. So they'll drop off Sunday night all the produce, and then okay. we go package Monday morning for delivery. Okay. Okay. I wonder once you get into summer if that will be more challenging with lack of. Um, you know, walk-in cooler space or things like that. We'll see where it goes. Like again, like, you know, we get 50 bags of cherry tomatoes. It really only takes up a flat of maybe two feet by oh. a foot. By okay. So wait, I, I thought you were getting other salad greens. You're, you're no, just, you're no, providing, no. it's all microgreens. Okay. All okay. Okay. From us. We just cultivated like a microgreen salad. Um, then right. We add on. So again, the point of eating salad is typically just greens aren't enough. We want to have some sort of vegetable. So we get basically pre-packed, bag of cherry tomatoes, a head of lettuce, one unit for one customer. And that'll just come I like see. That. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Wow. And, and, and how is that going for you guys in terms of profitability? Is it, is it worthwhile? Is it something that if all this stuff that's going on right now blows over, yep. are you going to continue this? Oh, for sure. Like we've had the, we had just from the, the last program we had to the current program, we probably had 40% repeats just signing up. Uh, and from that, we've already had to request for the fall. So we're going to run it uh, back to back because, again, every season is different vegetables. We want to kind of keep incorporating them. Again, on a business side, it's a huge cash infusion at the beginning of the eight week period uh, that wow. we can kind of run it off of that. So, again, it allows you to make uh, financial decisions based upon that, but you're pre selling everything. So, and then people have kind of a, it incorporates that into their diet. They get fresh vegetables. As it coming to winter, I think it's going to be even better because they know November, December, they're going to get fresh veggies, fresh microgreens. It becomes habitual, and that's the best way to bring it to the market. Right, right. Wow. So I'm just I'm looking at your website again here, and how does somebody order from you guys? Do they just have so to contact we, you? Yeah. Uh, Tim is a contact. Listen, we've always had the belief that we do. We want the relationship. We want. We believe that the, on a business perspective, that repeat sale and those continual ongoing sales is going to come from developing some sort of first from an educational base. A lot of donor micros are, especially a couple of years ago. You know, it's becoming a little more commonplace, but unless you're in the culinary side, everyone's referring to sprouts, sprouts, you know? So we got it. We want the education perspective, but more so than that, 
even to understand the flavor profiles. Some people don't like spice. Some people don't like this. I traditionally have never really eaten a lot of broccoli for whatever reason. But yeah. the other perspective, some people don't like don't like broccoli. Well, I'm not going to buy my broccoli microgreen. Completely different flavor profile, different, completely different ways to use it. Add it to a smoothie in the morning. You're not going to do that with a whole head of broccoli typically, right? right. So yeah. the educational perspective really allows for people to have understanding what they're purchasing. So that's why we always use direct platforms. So they reach out through Facebook. We'll get back to them. We'll qualify them through whatever avenue we can. We explain the delivery process. Versus you come through a shopping cart, hey, you put an order, pick a date. Well, great. You don't know your user. You don't know. There's no relationship. That is what really allowed us to pivot so quickly in March is we had probably said 500 people to fall back on through developing it over the course of those two years where they know what we have. They know the quality. So we can send out a mass email. Hey, guys, we're offering this discount price. We need to move product quickly out of the firm that day. And they bought it up. It was a really good opportunity. And then it re reinstilled a lot of uh, purchases. People like, oh yeah, I remember those guys. They had an order maybe a couple months. They start ordering now. We have new products, new procedures. It's kind of cool. So the, the platform we kind of created through the website was simply just another avenue to order within the parameters to which we're trying to achieve, which is that communication. So they can send us a message where they're located. So right away we know their air drink, right away we know their Calgary, wherever it might be. So then we can respond a little more efficiently now instead of having to qualify that in a preliminary email now the information is already in front of us and we can get the communication and the information a lot quicker and mm. then just start the business going. Mm. And that, I mean, I've, I, you know, I've done a, a lot of these delivery type things in the past myself and I always found that, yeah, there's benefit to the communication of the customer like you're doing, but I just wonder, is it, is it getting to a point with the amount of deliveries you're doing that, you might be running into some problems of scale and having to do all that. Like that's a lot of emails back and For forth sure. is, there, you know, it's like, again, we're not taking on 50 new people a day. Like we want to scale up appropriately and uh, proportionally. So we're not getting like, we're not getting hundred clients a day. We're having to you know, bring a secretary in. Right. But what happens is the repeat orders just take care of themselves. I'd say like in the last two hours, we've got probably 20 orders just coming through the phone. Those who, Hey, I want this because they start to know your delivery day, your standardized delivery day. They have a, we have a relatively standardized menu as we incorporate and adopt new microgreens in. We launch it very proportionally. We don't do, hey, 10 new greens right now. We might do one every two weeks, one every month, whatever the, the market dictates, right? So we'll get a message, hey, can I get two rides, one piece? Boom, done. We already have the person's name, address. They know everything. So yeah, we'll see you Saturday between 10 and 1. So it's you know a five-second response back. Now, again, yes, on scalability, we don't want to continue this forever. So that's why we adopted kind of the website aspect. So it can kind of, you know, this is very preliminary, almost beta and style. We're testing it out. We all did this one only four days ago. And we've had probably 20 emails come through just from that. Great. Now it streamlines the operation a little bit more. Then we'll streamline it even further from that. But we only do direct to sale. We have no waste to the farm, as we've spoken about. Everything in the farm is always pre-sold. We never yeah. carry in for it we want the freshest product going out with the longest shelf life. So that, so we want to kind of work on a few metrics to kind of, you know, alleviate. So someone wants to order, but if they've ordered two weeks ahead of time, you might lose a client base because it's pre-order, right? Sometimes yeah. we're greens tomorrow. So it's good. It, that's just part of the learning curve as we grow and adopt and obviously being retail predominant right now, that is new for us. So we're trying to work within what we have, but again, we want to roll it out properly, sustainably, not just do a bunch of flash in the pans, and nothing sticks and then we end up jeopardizing relationships. We certainly don't want that. So, Right, right. No, I, li I love that. I love your approach, your, your sort of slow and steady approach with that. And it's obviously working. Um, you know, you, you did say at the beginning that you're still selling to 20, even with all this going on right now, you're still selling to 20% of the restaurants that you've been, you got 20% yep. restaurants still. What kind of restaurants are those right now? A lot of takeout places or well, what, what are those? Pretty close across the U.S. and Canada, like everyone's doing with, you know, curbside delivery. So basically the cooking indoors and you pick it up and someone drops it off to your car. Basically pick up takeaway. That's really what the model, the most places they're trying to adopt just to get some sort of revenue coming into the restaurant. So what we have, I said, we have everything from restaurants to hotels. We have a big hotel just reopened here because uh, also golf course can reopen. So they have a massive uh, 36 volt golf course attached. So they've reopened, you know, again, within the sustainability of Alberta and the rollout. 
Uh, the ones that have always kept on going, it was a smaller format, maybe a pound or two pounds here. But again, a lot of our microgreens have always been developed that they can be very sustainable through uh, even the takeout perspective, that they can hold up to heat. Uh, or they might do in a separate container that could just be added on like a garnish base, right? So again, it has been a lot, only about, I think about 15 or 20 we've kind of kept. We have a few more rolling out uh, as you know, the, when everything kind of comes back online here on Monday in Alberta for the culinary side. So we're anticipating a slow rollout, but again, we still got to have business protectionism. So that's why we always, and still will focus on the retail until this gets back to some sort of new normal here. Right. Yeah. Right. Otherwise, um, it could be a totally different game. I mean, it'll be interesting yeah. to see how, when things um, start to open back up, how, I, you know, I could see if you had a bunch of your pre-existing restaurant customers come back online, all of a sudden you're slammed. Yeah, again, we're, we have the space and capacity to deal with that. You've seen our operation. Like we have basically all our racks ready to go. Lights, it's just a matter of, now again, it might not be online tomorrow. As yeah. our crops are very high turnover, you know, running roughly DTM 10 days on 80% of our crops. So they get a date, we can roll it out within less than two weeks. And that's right. quite better. A lot of places, again, because within that time frame, they can determine their food costs. They can see, again, nobody really knows what to anticipate because you're taking yeah. the human factor into account. Like, are people going to come out? Are they still going to stay at home? So that's why we work with distributors. We do a, we work with online platforms and we sell a product through other platforms. Take advantage of the current marketing. They already spend the money on it. We just piggyback off of that and use that. So we have numerous different revenue streams that we have played into to develop that, um, to have consistent cash flow to meet that reliance. If it's up and down 20, 30% every month, that's not going to allow for proper business decisions. So we need to, and that's what we've done in the last two months to cultivate a new business model based on the environment, but has to allow for the additivity, um, be adaptable. And yes. as this, this whole thing evolves and we, and I don't think we're really going to see it evolve fully until probably late fall. There's going to be continual changes. People are going to have to adopt restaurants closing, seeing restaurants re, you know, closing and reopen and rebrand. It's a whole new model. People are taking advantage of that. I see a lot of restaurants can be huge. They're doing, you know what, take two months, and now they're doing their renos they've always wanted to do. But they're yeah, too busy to do it. There's yeah. a lot of things happening behind the curtain that things would be a huge opportunity um, down the road for this. It's just, but again, you have to know your end user. You have to know, and that's where my background has been super helpful, having, you know, 20 years in the culinary side, knowing how to talk to chefs, how to bring product to them. You've got to work with them. It's got to be a, a win-win. Otherwise, it's not going to work for anybody. Right, right. Um, so, so what, what does the production on the floor look like right now? You know, when I was there in February, you were like 400 flats a week or something like that. Yeah, are, are you, are, four or five right now, we're doing about 300, so about 20, okay. 30, 25 to 30% down right now. But again, okay. higher margins, we're doing more of the, the retail. So that's where it's been able to encapsulate it. And fun, we're actually moving into a lot of new projects. Um, there's some fun things on the horizon we're gonna be testing out and uh, I'll chat with you about here uh, down the road. But yeah, we have some really cool stuff coming in that we're gonna do. Um, yeah, developing actually a whole new you know, subcategory of a business model. That's gonna be pretty yep. cool stuff. So we're working on that. Um, one big project we're working with a really amazing um, chef here in town is multi restaurants. We um, actually piggybacking off a lady who has an, you know, almost a couple hundred acres down south and yes. we're cultivating and working together on a completely 100% sustainable farm to table method that we're going to service one of his whole restaurants completely with this farm. So we basically tilled off almost two acres of land, hand plant. We're going to plant probably 40, 50 crops this year to see where things are at. We're running a huge greenhouse operation. This year is going to be just a baby year. See what grows, what tests is brand new for all of us. We're bringing yeah. a lot of birds in or bringing some um, live. We're going to see where it goes. It's going to be really cool. Wow. And he's shooting for the best restaurants in the country. It's going to be amazing. And that's wow. what we want to bring up. So it's a whole new project for us. We've got stuff on our side. But again, you've got to adapt to the, the current environment and have fun along the way. And that's always been our philosophy. And uh, again, we're just growing little greens. We've got to enjoy life along the way and have fun and do this. But you've got yeah. to take your sides of the coin here. Wow. Amazing. So it sounds like, you know, kind of in a nutshell, all of this was good for you in a way because it kind of forced you to adapt um, and you, it kind of exposed some potential fragilities that you obviously compensated for right away. But it sounds like um, 
you, you, it's kind of forced you to find these, these new things, diversify yourself a lot more, cover yourself from yeah. potential fragilities. And um, it sounds yeah. like going forward, it's, it's, it's looking really yeah. good and for you guys. The, the clients aren't going anywhere, the retail clients, like people are still gonna order at home. We've now developed, like people are creatures of habit. We've now developed the habit of ordering into your house. So new policies, you know, delivery fees are getting lower. Like so many new things have come about as a result of this. It's really cool. People will slow down. They're starting to eat healthier. How many things we watch people learning how to cook? New skill sets are getting developed. People are wanting yeah. to order a lot more cool things like microgreens can now become adopted into your daily diet. Whereas before they were a niche product on the side of a restaurant. So this consistent, you know, trickle down effect in this current environment, I think is going to be an incredible opportunity moving forward if you have the infrastructure in place to do so or be willing to adapt your current model. There's so much opportunity. We just basically, yeah. we did and we just ex expanded it. And the best part is we now, this market isn't going anywhere. So now we added on an extra, what, 10 grand a month, whatever it is from this sector. And yeah. that will continue in once we have all the restaurants back on and all those things. So we increase the revenue just through this natural adaptation of the current environment. So it's, right. cool. it's been fun and we've learned a lot about ourselves. We've also had to slow down because we lost, what well, we did, we lost business. So we now we're looking at new ways of having revenue in the downtime where we would have done, you know, you know, hour after hour of you know packaging for wholesale clients. So it's really been cool to sit back. And I've heard this from so many uh, professional chefs, or restaurants with the kind of opportunity, even in this environment, to sit back and just reevaluate what they want the business to look like, what they want things to do. And I think it's gonna be an amazing opportunity moving forward. And, and we're seeing a lot of changes in this atmosphere. And I'm excited for it. I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to come both from it. Wow. That's a really, really optimistic attitude where you're basically, you're, I like your attitude. You're very, re, you're very realistic. Um, that kind of reminds me of Ray Dalio, his whole thing of uh, just having sort of severe uh, realism of just like, what is the situation? Your opinion of it doesn't really matter. It's uh, what is the situation? How do you make the best of it and, and move forward? It's really cool to see how you guys have done that. Take yourself out of the equation and look at it empirically and take a step back. And it is what it is. You can't change it. So you might as well work with it. Yeah, exactly. If yeah, Do you want to enjoy what you're doing? Do you want to keep making money at it? Um, yeah, it's amazing. So, um, um, yeah, so that, I mean, that, that's really good stuff, David. Um, I mean, one question here came up. This is kind of unrelated to what we we're talking about, kind of a newbie question, but uh, maybe, maybe you could offer some perspective on it. Is uh, uh, somebody says here, what should a new grower focus on um, if he's, when, when he's starting out? So you're starting out a microgreens operation. Yep. What are, in your opinion, what are, what are the, what's the thing you should focus on the most right away? 100% simplicity. Uh, high yield, high turnover. You want to look at four to five crops, uh, 10 day DTMs, start to finish, three to four day germ, six to seven day life cycle out the door. Those are the crops, convenient, approachable. You don't need to grow, you know, chrysanthemum or shneku or ones that don't, they work, but you know what, you don't want to educate on. Like the radishes, the peas, the brassicas, the broccoli, convenient, approachable products, they can dial in very quickly. Not long term crops right now, Anything under 14 days for me is kind of the, the goal. I predominantly always let our farm just to have that high turnover and yep. make it very for all, all people and all parties. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what's one of the main things that has, um, I mean, I, I know the answer to this question, but it'd be kind of good to hear your, you talk about it a bit more because a lot changed and I've got some good video stuff coming with you soon, but um what are some of the, the main things that changed for you guys in the last couple of years? Like you were in that, you were in your basement of your home. Now you're in a, in a larger, like 6,000 square feet or something like that. Uh, maybe not 6,000 square feet, but how big is the space you're in now? 35. Okay. Yeah. So, so what's, what's really different for you guys now and the way you, the way you operate your business and how it's set up now than what it was a year ago? The irony is like by expanding, we probably we moved out in the fall and uh, we've probably increased um, trays, revenue, everything, probably 30 to 40% since then in eight months. But ironically enough, we've actually decreased our labor probably by 20, 30%, just by having the elbow room. We were pretty squished in there. We were able to figure it out. But just right. having this streamlined operation, be able to format the footprint of the farm, the galley style, how we kind of organize, getting a lot of new equipment, um, all that really has helped out. But the biggest thing is now being able to so, take a step back and where's the market going? Where's the trends going? 
we don't we don't follow trends by any means. Oh, we want the niche product. I see yeah. farmers that when things went hit the fan in March, they still got product now growing from a February plant because they're doing yeah. Whether they give the edible flowers, those long term crops. So you still have you're out of space due to a previous business model. We were able to turn over a complete business model into a farm in less than two weeks. We had to change how we did our crops, how Incredible. we did business. Everything was pre sold. Yeah. We had zero waste to the farm. Now we had to adopt to a retail model, which was fluctuating. People didn't always order. So if that was, so then take a step back from that, if not always ordering consistently, how do we cultivate a standing order? Well, let's do some programs. Let's do monthly subscriptions. I said we took on this salad support from a great farm out of the U.S. They were doing this, and it was amazing. So we adopted yep. that into our model. So how do you get yep. cash fusion quickly? So that's really been the adaptation. But on the premise, it's just been fun. We can now grow new, uh, new unique crops. We consolidate a harvest and our planting dates. We had a part-time employee come on, so we can stay, take a step back. They can plant. You know, I plant I don't know how many hundred thousand crops in my life. They can now plant pea shoots. I don't need to plant pea shoots anymore, right? They can do yeah, that. Right. Well, I plant some really more unique crops, or I can work yep. on some. We're doing a lot of micro herbs right now. So trying to look at trends that can kind of encapsulate both markets, both wholesale and the retail perspective. Yeah, yeah. And, and a little bit of that ties into this next question here from John who says, um, with a lot of people, uh, with a lot of people's financial futures not looking so good, what do you think about the feasibility of selling premium greens? I mean, we touched on this a little bit, yeah. um, but I think it's kind of a big picture thing. Maybe not maybe the, what your opinion is on the big picture, not maybe so much specifically to your situation. But what do you think the feasibility is of selling premium products with a higher price point like microgreens? Uh, he says, I know you both touched on this a bit, um, but do you think the market will shrink like sort of the overall market? Uh, as you were saying, just seeing um, where you're at and the hustle and at and hustle harder. Yeah, I guess like the niche market is this, it's a you know, multitude of different pronged answers to that. The biggest thing you gotta look at, you know, with the urban or, you know, rural Kansas, you know, niche products are demographic based and um, geographic based to a degree for sure. If you're, you know, Manhattan, you can probably sell more to, you know, a Michelin restaurant where there's no Michelin restaurants in Canada, but there's high end restaurants. Where you gotta break it down to is revenue and cost per tray. And I call it real estate. How long is that 10, 20 tray sitting on your shelf? If I can do a tray of radish six days under a shelf, I can have a revenue, let's say 20 bucks, $25 in revenue off that. If I have a five week crop, so five weeks under the light, I'm not gonna get five times evaluation from it. Right. Now maybe the chef wants it, and this is where I've seen a lot of farms fault over the years. Not that they're so they're not falling in a bad way, just like they just haven't succeeded because they they become yes farms. Every time a chef comes in, you and I talk about this, Curtis. Sometimes I want micro celery. Great, I'll grow it. Well, they order one time thing, it took you a month to figure out, one month to grow it, and they order once and never talk to you again. Right? Whereas that time valuation could come back in to other crops that are more readily accessible to everybody. And that's how we always cultivate our business model, looking at crops that have typically been here for 20, 30 years, but have been misused. They're too expensive now because they've become commonplace. And we just re, just within that wheelhouse, we've just recreated how to do a better pea shoot, how to do a better yeah. rabbit. And that yeah. is what we focus on. So we focus on seeding density. We focus on you know, DTM. What is the best day to harvest? cut sizes, all of those. So that's the question. I think there's a huge opportunity still for niche products. People still gonna want edible flowers. They're gonna want those really unique crops for sure. But where does it fit in your goals within the parameters to what you're trying to achieve on a business perspective? Um, and then you gotta dial it in according to that. So it, it is situational, arbitrary to your farm for sure. But I think there's always gonna be a market for it. This is not something we focus on because I see value in other areas right now. As we get bigger, we might adopt certain ones and we'll go from there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I'll add to that a little bit too, um, is that I think, I think that the, the question that John is asking is a good question because there's no doubt that oh, yeah. um, there is, there's concern about that. But I mean, you've obviously adapted. Um, it certainly means that if, if there's less fine dining um, maybe those customers for the grower might be a little less, uh, a little less easy to get, but they're still going to be there. Um, you, you touched on it a little bit, which I liked is that, you know, you guys consistently focus on quality and better ways to do things. 
that's how you carve out a better niche in a situation where Correct. maybe at you know a, a year ago or even even three or four months ago um there was all these restaurants doing business and uh, economies chugging along things times look good you know mm-hmm. i don't know how much we, we were hitting that saturating point especially in calgary but i mean a lot of the big cities i i was visiting so many people have been jumping onto the farm to table bandwagon that it seemed like we were kind of riding this big gravy train and mm-hmm. maybe now that has changed but yeah i i think you're 100 percent. I, I think there's going to be room in the market it's it's really just making a better business plan, a better product, and going at it more intelligently. So, yeah. because you know the, the the reality is of it is too is that if you weren't doing that anyways, and you were kind of just going along and following the latest trend, not really foreseeing, th- thinking about um, things in the future you probably would have gotten shaken out of the business at some point anyways, because something would have come along that you didn't anticipate and then you would have got screwed. And I know for sure there's a lot of microgreen growers that, that had that happen to them. However, um, your story is not totally uncommon. I'm actually seeing um, what you guys have done uh, been repeated uh, all over the world. It's not, it's, it's not totally unique. You know, people, but it's, you know, it's, it's business. You can't ever, you have know, Black Swan that came in two months ago. No one could just be that. That's the reality. You shut down a whole <laughs> sector. It can't be done. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's unprecedented for sure. But how did you construct your business prior to that that allows you to make a change very quickly? And not only yeah. just to change your business or just empirical, like tangible stuff. How is your mindset? Did you, are you able to adapt? Some people just like, no, I just fold up. I'm going to skip the season. I'm going to do this. I, you know, but everything that is dictated right now is based upon who you are, you know, your, your personality, but there is, there's so much opportunity. It depends on your goals, what you want to achieve from it. But again, you have to have an insight into your own market, into your own economy and understand how to bring product about. And it's taking a step back and it's looking at it very simply. These are just yeah. produce, micro, anything. You need a medium, you need light, you need water. That's it. So yeah. grow it and then see where things are going to go, but test the market. Test the yeah. opportunity. Just don't come from the previous mindset because it's not there anymore. It yeah. will well, change the- Yeah. So, so, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. the, the, one, the one thing that's, that's very advantageous about microgreens in this situation, and I, I saw this in what you guys did, is that, like you said, your average crop is a 10-day cycle. So at the end of the day, even if you had to bite the bullet for a whole week's worth of crops, it was only a whole week's worth of crops. If you yeah. were a farmer, like a lot of these growers down in California that had like a million pounds of product for something yeah. that they would have sold in a traditional marketplace, that crop took four months to get Last to market and now you can't sell it. Now yeah. you're really looking at overhead because you had to seed that crop in the greenhouse you grew it to transplant size, you transplanted yep. it, you cultivated it multiple times. Yep. Unbelievable amount of labor to get that product to market. Whereas at the end of the day, a microgreens farm really is only going to get smoked in one week's of product because you've one always second. got an, a short, yeah, exactly. You've got a short enough lag time that you can adapt to potential new things. Like you, you alluded to it a little bit talking about um, restaurants being, uh, okay, th- they might change. Now things start opening up. You're going to have plenty enough time to f- hit that date and talk to those chefs to basically grow that product for them. So exactly. y- you're still, you as a microgreens farm, you're still set up so much better to weather that potential uncertainty than any other type of operation. Very much so. And again, what it comes down to, it's like, it's no avail to anybody, but you all choose your business model. You're a field farmer, that's a model. Now, no one could see this coming about, but I chose my greens coming out of the culinary uh, background because I wanted to control my environment. But more importantly, I wanted to be able to help others control theirs. Uh, funny enough, in a restaurant, you're so dictated by the economy you don't even know. Like, I've seen prices of, say, a case of cauliflower go from $50 one week to 80 the next week, just simply because of oil prices in the U.S., there's yep. so many different factors. You, so even though you think you're controlling your food cost on a 
in a restaurant establishment, you're not. You work with some of these large distributors by contract, they will literally change the pricing overnight because that's yeah. what they're going to trickle down effect from oil, from transport costs, from labor costs, whatever might happen, right? So you're not really even in control of your labor, or excuse me, your food costs. But if you can come to a place and mitigate all those external challenges they've had as part of the business model, and you can take all that away, that is how you bring value to them. And that's what we always understood from the beginning. So when we cultivated this, I wanted to take away all challenges of farming, environment, yeah. pests, animals, right? Microgreen farming was a great avenue to do so. But even within that, microgreen farming is just a stepping stone to any indoor farming, vertical, hydroponic, you can do so many opportunities, options, but are you continually doing that? Are you continually evolving to adapt to the current marketplace? And that's what you have to ask yourself all the time for sure. Yeah, yeah. Kind of a question I have for you on the production side of things, maybe on the more on the back end, but are you, have you seen much change in your supply line uh, of being able to access seed? Uh, well, no, we haven't because we also, uh, in March, I probably ordered uh, six months worth. So we yes. kind of saw what was happening and uh, reached out very quickly for that, the packaging, all that. So we periodically ordered over the last two months uh, from a couple of our companies and we've had no problem getting it. There's a little, again, it's part of just a relationship. We, you know, we order, I don't know, tens of thousands of pounds, right? A year or so, yeah. we have a lot coming to the door. So there is a relationship that I think allows us to get a little quicker than yeah. a one-off order, but we've also really prepped this out. So we've always had, our farms always had 90 to 120 days of seed, always on site. Again, part of the end user perspective, last thing I want to do is tell a chef, hey, I got nothing for you next week, sorry, no crop. At least yeah. if I had a 90 day lead time, it's being respectful of them, they're plating their restaurant. So again, everything yeah. is always thinking of the end user perspective. So we've always had three to four months on site. We just doubled down and just bought a bunch more. We have probably enough for most of our crops anywhere from six to nine months easily on site. Yeah. Yeah. So we're just topping it up as things come in. So we're not hoarding by any means, but again, it's abysmal. We want to make sure well, that's, that's, crop, Yeah. Right? Yeah. Not well, over. and you have to. I, I, think, I think in this environment, um, people are seeing more and more what they should have done anyways. I, I find that's kind of the interesting thing, even, you know, non-farm related, just kind of about this whole situation that we're in is that all this thing really did was expose and exacerbate more of what was already happening. People were already ordering online. People were already basically spending most of their time in their home. Like yeah. th this whole thing just pushed all these trends that were happening and put them to the forefront on the, exactly. With respect to businesses such as yours, you know, in a way, it uh, exposed some frig fragile points, but yeah. also allowed you to hunker down on the things that were the strong points that made you anti-fragile, that that sheltered you from, protected you from that black swan event. Uh, it's, yeah. it's it's quite amazing to see how you guys came through this. No, I appreciate that. It's been. But again, it's just having the foresight into seeing where things can come from. But again, it's just being preparatory. Part of our routine at farm is every single week we do an inventory. We know exactly what's on site because we can get, because you're micro farming and any farming in general, micro farming specifically, we can get an order on a Thursday that could be an extra, you know, needing 10 pounds of seed per month. And if I only have three months of supply and I have 20 pounds, now I'm down to one and a half months of supply. So we need to up that up, right? So every that's a part of our, our, our tasks. Every week we do an inventory of packaging and seed. So we never fell down. We had, you know, when we first began, like anyone, we're trying to learn, like, oh, we only have two weeks of seed left. Luckily we were able to order it. If that had happened in April, forget about it. We had a pull crop and now then, obviously that trickle down effect, now it affects our customers. Maybe we have Joe down the street that loves one of our crops, now can't get it. Great, now yeah. he doesn't order, right? So being prudent in your business all the time is incredibly helpful for sure, but that it starts with, just knowing a business and understanding them. That's one of the biggest things we teach on in consulting is just we come from a business perspective because this is such a great opportunity, just not just in the current situation, but just to have a side hustle, to have that spare tire in your wheelhouse. So when you do lose your job, you have an extra grand to fall back on, the very quick ROI, very low capex, and you can get something up and running. And you're offering a service. You're bringing incredibly fresh local product to consumers, to restaurants. If you understand all those perspectives, it's not even about sales anymore. It's about just working in the climate and bringing value to people. 
And and is that yeah? I mean, you got you guys have always been fairly prudent with those things, but has 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 all of this um, just made you more extreme in that approach and and making sure that you're you're always ordering more whatever it is packaging seed. Like, what's the benchmark to where you get down to to say, okay, let's let's do another order? Uh, well, again, right now we're basically we do every probably every two weeks now we kind of do. We're not really getting uh, like it's not like the culinary side where we'll get like ten restaurants in a week. And I got there, I have we had a lot of flux obviously because we were always we were probably adding on per month easily ten to fifteen new clients a month. That was pretty much our routine. So that was always adding a lot of flux. We had to make sure that was a lot more depth. Now with um, the retail, we have a pretty good baseline to go by, plus or minus maybe 10%. Uh, I wouldn't say by any means we're doing anything extreme. Again, we don't need it, so we're not going to order it. Again, I don't need two years of supply because I know the chain will come back on. But we are definitely, we're more in communication with our suppliers. So the guy, my packaging guy, our seed companies, wherever we're ordering from, hey, how are things going? Are we seeing trends? Are you guys, yeah, we're good to go. I could talk to them pretty honestly. So if there is an issue, I'll probably jump on it. We haven't seen that. So again, I want to spread the wealth as much as we can for sure. So we right now we're pretty good till fall. That's what we kind of based it on. I saw a basis six month change. So March yeah. we ordered various and almost Christmas, and then we'll just kind of you know go from there. Uh, yeah, and just kind of take it day by day in that accord. But we also know our business in and out. So I know I'm not like getting like another you know 50 pound per week order tomorrow. If I did, then it obviously adapt to that. It's you yeah. know maybe now pound here or there, we can be prudent and we know we have the flux to be able to adjust for that, um, that differentiation. Wow. Wow. Amazing stuff. So, um, this is, this has been great, David. What, what, Thanks. uh, I mean, a couple things, um, what's, what's new for you guys, uh, going forward? Like what, uh, what are some things that, uh, is happening for you guys right away? Um, if there are things that we haven't already talked about, are you guys doing any, uh, doing any are you doing those far i guess you're not doing the farm tours now because uh of this whole thing like that. our <laughs> biggest thing would definitely be more the education so it's uh, the consulting's been a big one so we've launched a you know kind of um a kind of four-week course that allows people to reach out to us where we kind of can do a very quick rundown one-on-one i always believe in the talking aspect i really want to kind of work with people one-on-one again providing we can give them value so that's why we only limit to a certain amount of countries just because we have reputation there we know the sea suppliers that we can give, you know, I can't work with every country because I don't know the supply chain. So right. we try to work with that, but again, we want it to be, here's our history, here's who we are, but we come from a very business perspective. There's a lot of material out there if you want to learn, we just try to mitigate the learning curve. So that's been yeah. the biggest thing, because we do a little more downtime, where I do, so I want to give back as much as we can, keeping it prudent to, you know, being careful economics, and we don't want to charge an arm and leg for it. We just want to kind of get as much value out. So we do believe in this opportunity. I think there's an amazing opportunity, not only to your, to help have a business, but feed your family. I don't think we brought bought a lot of produce in the last two years, really. Yeah, we use this to incorporate this into our diet. So it's really so you're saving money. It's on the on the grocery side, right? So that's probably been the biggest change is to adopting a lot more of the consulting course aspect. Uh, we're focusing on some new crops just because we have the downtime to play with them uh, yep. and with the space. So that's been kind of fun to bring on some new stuff, get some new samples in, some really random. Uh, yeah, see where it goes. Uh, possibly get into some living stuff down the road here that we're going to sell off kind of greenhouse style. So a lot of things we're playing with and having fun along the way and until things pick up, but we have the real estate to do that and the time. And yeah, I want to utilize that to the best of our ability right now. So we have the downtime, might as well make most of it. Wow. And so I guess if you got a little bit of downtime, you probably got a bit more time to do some consulting then too, right? For sure. Yeah, we do probably, um, I don't know, probably 10 hours a week right now. So 10 wow. sessions a week. That um, through the main companies or countries we kind of work with, but yeah, it's fun. Again, we try to, we always want to be prudent to the people as well, so I don't take on too much because we want to make sure we can give the most value to them. So we're not obviously tired of doing this. We deal with people in Australia, so you got a sixteen-hour time difference. So we want to make sure that we're always giving um, everyone we work with one hundred percent attention. So we only take on you know maybe a couple a day um, during the week. We also want our downtime with our family kind of thing. So that's the new consulting site we kind of launched there to kind of go over the four week course. Uh, yeah. Obviously, my background is you know being culinary. That's the biggest thing we did. We I did I basically created menus for 15 years. I ordered food, know those chains, know the costs. So being able to bring that's giving you an insight into the entire food industry. So that's something that we've always had a lot of uh, 
insight into and has been able to work with a lot of people who, because it can be intimidating talking to a chef or talking to a restaurant and how to bring product to them when they have a lot of options. So that's one thing we always want to help and, and create a simple perspective towards, uh, towards microbean farming. We don't overthink it. We look at it very empirically and we want to have a, we got to have fun doing it. You got to love what we do. We love growing. We love having a good time. We love being, getting your hands dirty and, and but seeing the end results, hearing from a family that their kids are eating pea shoots like a snack. There's, yeah. something so, there's something so cool about that, that you can bring value to people in so many different areas. Right. And so I guess the best way for people to get in touch with you is just microacres.ca. Yep. So uh, on the- it's probably the best through the consulting there. Um, yeah, or through Instagram as well is always fine. But yeah, that's where we kind of cultivated that the website to streamline. Uh, let us know where you're from what you're looking for, and then we'll work with you too. And then we also tailor a lot of the sessions. So depending on where you're at, if you already have a farm established, some stuff we skip, you don't necessarily need to always know where to source stuff. Let's kind of focus on other areas that bring higher value to you, maybe selling, marketing, social media, any areas. We really just want to customize and tailor a lot of the attributes to you as well. Wow, amazing stuff. Hey, well, David, this has been really great. I really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, I look forward to talking to you more and seeing and maybe circling back um, when, thing, when there's another shift in how things are, have gone and seeing how you've adapted to that because it seems like you guys have really positioned yourself to be a truly anti-fragile business. And uh, that's, a, that's a huge inspiration for a lot of people. And um, yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time, man. Thanks, Chris. Really appreciate the time as well. We'll talk soon, okay? Okay, brother. Take care. Take care, man. Yeah, bye-bye.